Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. The national park system contains more than parks that preserve incredible landscapes or moments in history. There are many units that honor an individual. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Today, the traveler takes a look at a national monument in southwest Missouri dedicated to George Washington Carver. Born to an enslaved young woman, Carver dedicated his life to agricultural research and science. His work helped struggling farmers in the South better their lives through better farming practices. The traveler's Lynn Riddick talks to park ranger Curtis Gregory at the monument about this unique site in the national park system and the inspirational legacy of the 20th century's most renowned black scientist. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Nova Scotia. 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kajimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit NovaScotia.com today to start planning your natural getaway. Do you love one-click shopping? With our partner, Interior Federal Credit Union, you can earn rewards just by making online purchases. You're missing out on rewards points if you're not using their Visa credit and or debit card. By adding these cards to your online shopping cart with Amazon, Walmart, or other shopping retailers, you can earn a point for every dollar you spend. Binge watching a lot with streaming services like Netflix and Hulu? Use their card for recurring payments to earn points as well. Visit their website, interiorfcu.org, and read their blog for more details and how to apply. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Imagine a young boy named George, born to an enslaved woman in the early to mid-1860s. A child so ingrained in the idea that he was someone else's property that he referred to himself as Carver's George. That boy was George Washington Carver, who grew up to be a renowned agricultural scientist, inventor, educator, and humanitarian, considered by many to be one of the greatest African Americans of all time. A national monument in his honor can be found in the southwest corner of Missouri, not far from Joplin. And here to talk about this extraordinary man is Curtis Gregory, park ranger at the George Washington Carver National Monument in Diamond. Hi, Curtis. Welcome to The Traveler. Hello, and thank you for having me at the park this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. As a young news reporter fresh out of college and working in that part of the country, I had an assignment at the Carver Monument, and I've been intrigued by the man ever since. Well, George Washington Carver is a very intriguing individual, very inspirational individual, and we love telling his story. Well, I have a lot of questions about his life and contributions, but first, why don't you describe the natural setting of the park and what visitors will find there? Okay, well, we are, again, we are the George Washington Carver National Monument, 
And what's so special about our little park is it's where George Washington Carver was born and where he lived for about the first, we believe, about the first 12 years of his life. So the park itself um, consists of 240 acres, about 140 acres of prairie. We have a wonderful three-quarter mile walking trail, wildflowers, some wildlife. You will see the area where George Washington Carver was born. We have a visitor center with three floors of exhibits, a film on George Washington Carver's life, as well as other historic features along the trail as well. Well, it's not exactly on the beaten path, but I do know that it's very pretty in that part of the country. No, you would you really would really want to have to come to this park because you're right, it is not on a highway. Most of the visitors that come to the park, they see the big brown sign on the interstate and they get to the park. And a lot of times the first thing a a visitor will ask is, why is this park here? When I think of George Washington Carver, I think of the South. Well, you know, most visitors, most of our visitors do, they think of the South because Carver lived at Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Alabama, for about 47 years. But, you know, he was born in Missouri, so he isn't uh, really a Missourian. Tell me about the number of visitors to the park annually. Annually, we get about, uh, we get about, I'd say, between 30 and 40,000 visitors a year. We do a lot of education programs here as well. Um, normally, we would have between eight to 10,000 kids here a year. So the park has a couple of firsts. It's the first national monument established to honor a Black American and the first to honor someone other than a president. How did the monument come about? Well, the monument story is, is very interesting. Carver died in January 5th, 1943. And shortly after that, six months later, the park was established in his honor. And so it's a it's a it's a really interesting story. And it, it kind of started before Carver's death, where there were basically some local people in the area that kind of got started with a grassroots movement for the establishment of the park. And they worked really, really hard. They contacted legislators such as Harry Truman and others, and they went on letter writing campaigns to write famous Americans for their support of the park. And in July, it paid off in 1943 when the park was established. Now, you mentioned Harry S. Truman. He was an old Missouri man himself, um, and he was born in Lamar, Missouri, not too far from where Carver was born. So did that help the establishment of the park to have him on board? Um, Well, yeah, I think it really did. I think it did help. Um, You know, Truman was a senator of the state, and um, the individuals that were a part of this organization worked with Truman and the um, local congressman, which was um, Dewey Short. So between Short and um, Truman, they helped with the with the establishment. Let's talk about Carver's early years and the very pivotal point in his life when he stopped referring to himself as Carver's George. As I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, the park is where Carver was born. Uh, he stayed and he was here for about uh, about twelve years of his life. The original owners of the farm. Moses and Susan Carver. Moses and Susan Carver were originally from um, Illinois, and they migrated out to this area about 1838 or so with some of Moses Carver's relatives. And so by the 1840s, Moses and Susan became the owners of 240 acres. And Moses was a farmer, and out of the 240 acres, supposedly he farmed about 100 acres, growing corn, wheat, potatoes and different types of crops that he would basically kind of sell. And the Carvers did this for about 20 years or so by themselves. And in 1855, Moses Carver purchased one enslaved girl by the name of Mary. Now, we don't know much about Mary or where Mary came from, but she was about 13 when she came on the Carver farm and was brought there supposedly to help Susan Carver out. 
we don't know which farm she came from. We don't know any, really anything about her. All we know is from a bill of sale that we have where he purchased her for $700 in 1855, a girl about 13 or so. You have that sure. document in the museum there? Yes, we have a copy of the document in the museum. And so shortly after she was born, and the, the interesting thing, she was the only enslaved person that the Carvers had. Shortly after Mary was here, she had her first son. His name was James. And then shortly after that, George was born. Now, we're not really sure when George was born. We think he was born between, he was born between 1860 to 1864, probably closer to 1864. The story goes that George's father was another enslaved individual on a neighboring farm who died in an accident before he was born. So George would have never known his father. So for a short while, George, Jim, and their mother, Mary, would have all lived together. Now, sometimes at the end of the Civil War, there was a lot of unrest in southwest Missouri. Well, an incident happened on the, on the farm where an individual or individuals came on the Carver farm and took Mary and took young, and George would have been a baby. Well, Moses Carver wanted to get them back, so he hired someone to go out to, you know, find them. And this is where the story becomes somewhat of a mystery. The story goes that this gentleman by the name of John Bentley was hired by Moses to go out to find, find George and Jim. And this individual went down in, on the border of Missouri and Arkansas, which is about 40 miles south of where the site's located. And that's where George was supposedly found. But there was never any, were any knowledge of the mother. And George was about, George was a baby, right? George would have been a, a baby, so he would never have remembered, he didn't remember any of this. So, you know, what happened to Mary? What happened to her? Was she sold off deeper in the South? Was she killed? It's just somewhat of a, of a mystery what, what happened to her. And she never saw her two boys again. You know, it wasn't uncommon for this time period for enslaved families to be separated. But a lot of times after the Civil War ended and, you know, slavery was abolished, that individuals would try to find their loved ones. But this did not happen for George and Jim. So George never knew his father and he barely knew his mother. So George was brought back to the Carver farm and Mr. and Mrs. Carver took care of the of the two boys and we believe George stayed here on the Carver farm until he was at least 12. As the boys were growing up, George was kind of a sickly little kid. I mean, he came back from this abduction or, or what have you, and he had whooping cough. And as a result of that, he was kind of a sickly little kid. So a lot of times he couldn't do, you know, hard chores and, you know, like some things what a boy would do on a farm. So he kind of helped Susan around the around the cabin site, which he did laundry, which we know that was one of his chores and other, you know, more household chores, which quite honestly helped him when he went off when he went off on his own. So, I mean, as far as we know, we, 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 we believe that the relationship was was a good relationship. George never in any of his writings and such, he never said any ill will uh, about Moses, Moses and Susan Carver. What was the impact of his education from living with the Carvers? Well, as far as we know, uh, well, there was a school. There was a school nearby the Carver farm, um, about a mile, a mile and a half from the Carver farm, for all the kids in the area to go to, except for George and Jim. George and Jim could not go to that school because it was for whites only. There's a possibility, we believe, that Moses Carver tried to admit the two boys into the school, but we believe it was the townspeople that didn't, would not allow that. So someone, an individual gave Moses Carver a little blueback speller, which, you know, was a popular book, school book of that time period. And supposedly George learned everything he said. He learned everything in that little 
blue back speller. We believe that Susan Carver may have been somewhat um, able to read and write. And we believe that Susan taught him, you know, some of the some of the basics. But he said he learned everything in that little blue back speller, which sparked his appetite for, for an education. And so he found out in a nearby town of Neo Show. Neo Show had a larger black population. So along with that population, there was a school for the black kids in the Neo Show area. And George found out about that school. And he, and he, and this is important, he decided on his own that he would leave the Carver Farm and he would go to that school. So about 1876 or so, George left with a few belongings and he never came back to live again. He came back to visit, but at the young age of about 12, he was on his own. And I think that's so courageous and brave of a kid for that time period to do that on their own. Absolutely. And so when he got to Neosho and he was trying to find a place to stay, he met a woman named Mariah Watkins. Tell us about that story. Yeah, that's it's a it's a very it's a fascinating story. So he left the Carver Farm, and he walked. He walked um, as far as we know. Moses didn't give him anything. He didn't even give him a ride. So he walked the eight miles to to Neosho. Well, he got to Neosho, and as far as we know, he only had only been to Neosho a few times. And he got to Neosho, found the black section of town and found out where the school was located. So next to the school was uh, was a house. And supposedly behind the house was a little barn or shed. And he decided that he would spend the night in this barn or shed to be ready to go to the school. Well, as the, sto- the story goes, and this is not really documented, but the story that the next day that this woman, Mariah, came out and found this kid in the barn and wanted to know why he was there. And so she took George in for about a year. And so like he did around the Carver Farm, you know, chores, he did chores at the Watkins house for his room and board. And he really, really thought a lot about Mariah and Andrew Watkins. Mariah and Andrew didn't have any children on their own. And so George um, lived with them for about a year. And he really, really thought a lot of Mariah, especially Mariah. Mariah she dabbled. She dabbled in herbs and plants. She was very spiritual, religious. She took him to church, which we believe that's where some where the spirituality really started at. And something else that's kind of important: Mariah introduced George to the black community for the first time. And um, as far as we know, here in Diamond, there weren't. I think George and Jim, and maybe another family, were the only blacks in this area. So when he got to the L show, he, you know, started to see people that looked more like him. So his experience in the L show, I feel, was a was a very, very positive experience for George. And Mariah Watkins was the woman who said, from now on, your name is George Carver. Is that fact? Is that fiction? Well, again, the story the story goes, and I often say story because some of the early years of George, George's life, they're not documented very well. And so these are stories or some things that have been, you know, passed down. And the story goes that Mariah wanted to know this kid's name. And so he said, my name is Carver's boy, George. And at that point, Mariah said, no, your name is, you know, your name is George. Your name is George. And, you know, he took the surname Carver. So she said, George Carver. Now, what's interesting is this is in Neo show about 1876 or so. It's just George Carver. The Washington's not there yet because the Washington comes a little later. When did the Washington come about? Well, the Washington came about, he left the Watkins farm um, about 1878 or so. Um, There was a family that was moving to Fort Scott, Kansas. He thought perhaps the school in Fort Scott would have been a little, was going to be a little bit better. So he asked the family if he could go to Fort Scott. So he left with his family and went from Neosho, 75 miles away, to Fort Scott, Kansas. 
in Fort Scott, Kansas, he found the job and found the school to be a lot better. Thought his life was doing, going pretty well in Fort Scott until March of 1879. In March of 1879, there was an incident that took place where there was a black man that was accused of a crime. So some of the people, well, this, and this individual was in jail. Well, some of the townspeople thought that the legal process was taking a little too slow. So they went to the jail and they overtook the sheriff, took the man out of jail. George said that they brought the man past where he was living and they hung him from a lamppost and set him on fire. Now, either George witnessed this or he was a part of it or whatever happened, he was somehow involved or witnessed this and it frightened him. It frightened him and he immediately left Fort Scott, Kansas. From Fort Scott, Kansas, he went to Olathe, Kansas. From Olathe, he went to Paola, Kansas. And from Paola, Kansas, he went to a little place called Minneapolis, Kansas. You know, Minneapolis was a small town, but it had a school there. And so George would have went to went to school in, in Minneapolis. Well, he was living in Minneapolis, and there was another George Carver in the town. So he decided to take the middle initial W, and the middle initial became Washington. So that's how his name kind of came about. And if you ever see any of his writings, he never hardly used the Washington he would sign his name George W. G. L. W. Carver. So that's how his name kind of came about. That's interesting. So, you know, he he relocated several times in Kansas. Uh, he found his way to Iowa and then eventually Alabama. So he really had a lifelong pursuit of education. Is that how you would sum that up? Oh, I definitely I would sum it up because when he was in Minneapolis, Kansas, from Minneapolis, Kansas, he went to he he went to Kansas City, and took a a typing course or such in Kansas City. When he was in Minneapolis, he got the we're not sure if he finished high school, got the equivalent of a high school education. In Kansas City, he took a, a a typing course or some kind of clerical course, a business course in Kansas City, and then from Kansas City, he went to Highland, Highland, Kansas, and in Highland, Kansas, there was Highland College. He applied on paper. And got accepted, but then when he showed up, they would not accept him because he was black. You know, very disappointed about that, but he didn't give up. He stayed in Highland for a little while, and then he moved out to western Kansas, out to uh, out near Ness County, Kansas. And out in Ness County, Kansas, he's home, he homesteaded out there and had other jobs. And then, for some odd reason, no one really knows why, but he moved to Iowa, moved to Winterset, Iowa. And really, no one knows why, but, you know, it was a good choice because while he was in Winterset, Iowa, he met a family, a doctor and Mrs. Milholland at, at a church, and they became his friends, and they encouraged him not to give up his goals of going to, of going to school. So in Winterset, he's in Winterset, about 20 miles away in Indianola, Iowa, is Simpson College, which is still open today. So they encouraged him to apply for Simpson College. So he applies to Simpson College. He gets accepted. When he shows up, they welcome him, welcome him at Simpson College. Simpson College at the time had an open door policy for all different ethnic groups. So while he was at Simpson College, he took art classes because that was his interest was art. When he was a little kid on the Carver farm, he learned art by being in the wooded area and making his own paints and such. And that's what he wanted to become more than anything. He wanted to become an artist. So while at Simpson College, he took several art courses. There was a teacher there that really liked George. She said, you know, you're a good artist, but I'm not sure how much of a good living you're going to be able to make being an artist. And so she kind of encouraged that maybe she, he, he should think about another, you know, kind of another career path. So. In this in one of his classes, he, you know, he was kind of a good drawer, so he'd almost do little illustrations of flowers and plants. And supposedly in this one class, he was bringing, you know, plants to class. So this teacher, her name was Etta Bud. She said, well, you know, maybe you should think about a career in botany. And so he thought that was, a, you know, good idea. And I always thought as well that George was kind of changing his mindset to want to help others. Before he left Mariah Watkins' house, there's an interesting story. 
what Mariah told him. And, and, and the story goes that Mariah said, whatever you do, George, whatever you do in your life, you must help our people as much as possible because they're starving for an education. And be like Libby, be like Libby. And Libby, she was referring to a little enslaved girl that actually taught her to read and write. And so I often think that that was in the back of his mind as well as when he was changing career paths. So he, um, this teacher, Etta Budd, you know, suggested this to him. What was interesting as well, um, Etta Budd's father happened to be a professor of horticulture at what is now Iowa State University. And so I'm not sure if that helped or not, but he transferred to what is now Iowa State University in about 18, about 1890. Iowa Agricultural School was one of the best agricultural schools in the country. And when George arrived on the campus, he was the only black student. Now, I'm not sure if there were any other black students that, you know, tried to, um, you know, enroll before Carver. But when Carver got there, he was the only black student. And it was interesting, too. You know, they admitted him to Iowa, what is now Iowa State University, but they didn't provide a lot of provision for him. For example, uh, he couldn't live in a dormitory. So a teacher gave him an, an office space for him to live. And at first he couldn't eat in the cafeteria as well. So he, he had to eat in the basement with the, at, with the kitchen help. There were a lot of students that were coming up from the South that did not accept, you know, you know Carver being there. And as I, as I said, he, for his first day, he got called a lot of, you know, you know, really damaging derogatory names, but he stuck it out. He stuck it out. And after a short period of time, People realized, or students or others realized that he was very smart. He got involved in a lot of activities on the campus. And in 1894, he graduated from Iowa State, what is now Iowa State University, the first black to achieve that and stayed there and got a master's degree as well. First black to receive a master's degree. Um, they wanted him to stay there to teach. He was a TA in the teaching uh, in the botany department. But George was thought that he wanted to go somewhere where he could help his people. And he used that phrase, helping his people most of his life. You're well equipped for what fight you choose. You have legs and arms and a brain to use. And a man who has written great deeds to do began his life with no more than you. You are the handicapped you must face. You are the one who must choose your place. You must say I'm Lynn Riddick, talking with Park Ranger Curtis Gregory at the George Washington Carver National Monument in Diamond, Missouri, and we'll continue our talk right after this short break. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. 
you can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. I'm Lynn Riddick, back now with Curtis Gregory. George Washington Carver was at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama for almost 50 years as head of the agriculture department. How did he find his way there? Well, how he found his way there is another interesting story about um, about Carver. So he's working on his master's, working on a master's degree in agriculture at what is now Iowa State University at the time, Iowa Agricultural College. And he's finishing his master's degree. Booker T. Washington is um, on a fundraising trip and he's in Iowa. And someone tells him that there is a young black student in the agriculture department at Iowa and you must meet this young man. So he arranged, and I'm not sure if they actually met in person or they corresponded through letters or such. I know letters, but I'm not sure if they met in person that will. Um, Booker T. Washington, you know, communicated with Carver and offered him a teaching position at Tuskegee. Well, Carver was already in negotiations with Alcorn State College in um, Mississippi to go there. And he changed his mind and accepted Booker T. Washington's offer in 1896 to go to go to Tuskegee Institute. Now, while he was at Tuskegee, you know, all those years there, his official published work consisted mainly of 44 practical bulletins for farmers. And I want you to tell us more about this. He knew that poor farmers could improve their lives by planting food crops in place of cotton. And he also knew what they were up against trying to plant in soils that had been depleted by too many cotton crops. So what can you tell us about the work he did about that and what was known at the time about soil enrichment and crop rotation? Well, you know, um, what's interesting about that, and you're exactly right, that, you know, when he got to Tuskegee, his job was to start the agriculture department and um, teaching, research, and, you know, going out into the communities and helping, helping rural farmers. Well, George noticed how, you know, bad the soil was in the in this section of Alabama. Um, Tuskegee is located in a, in a county called um, Marion County, and, and, and the soil and such was bad. So to enrich the soil, George encouraged the farmers and others to grow, to grow peanuts, to put nitrogen back into the soil, to enrich the soil so you can, you know, so your soil could be rich so you could grow other types of crops and so you can make a living so you so you could become you know self-sufficient and so that's what he encouraged now you know crop rotation diversifying crops wasn't new and a lot of people were doing it uh, you know a lot of farmers and such were doing it but it was special and some of these some of these rural black farmers were not doing that and so that was the job of carvers as well as Tuskegee Institute to help individuals, to help students and to help farmers and stuff to become more self-sufficient. Students would learn a a trade or a vocation so they could help others as well. And so Carver's job, as I mentioned, besides teaching in the classroom, research and such, was going out into those communities and helping farmers to improve their lives. And you're correct about the bulletins. The bulletins were, um, Carver wrote about 45 of what were known as these agriculture bulletins. And the agriculture bulletins were teaching aids that would help farmers and farmer families so they could, you know, become more self-sufficient, so they could improve, improve their lives, which was the goal of Tuskegee Institute. He recognized the nutritional benefits of peanuts, and they were cheap, and they were easy to grow. And so his book... How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing It for Human Consumption resulted. And I actually flipped through that document and 
it has very detailed instructions on planning and it's completely user friendly without any scientific jargon. And he says, the peanut exerts a dietetic or a medicinal effect upon the human system that is very desirable. He says, a pound of peanuts contains a little more of the bodybuilding nutrients than a pound of sirloin steak, while there are more than twice as much heat and energy producing nutrients. So how was this book, this document received? And was this the point where he started gaining national prominence? Well, you know, it, it's interesting, those those bulletins, and uh, you made a very, very interesting point about how the bulletins were written. A lot of times, those agricultural bulletins that were produced by, you know, like USDA and such, were written in scientific terms. What George wanted to do, he wanted to write a pamphlet that the common man could understand and read. And so over, like you said, over his lifetime, um, those 40, uh, those nearly 47 years at Tuskegee, he wrote about 44 of them, about half of them, the first half of when Booker T. Washington was at Tuskegee, when he Carver was there from 1896 to 1915. And they were well received. Um, they would hand these bulletins out at, um, at conferences, at fairs, um, George Washington Carver. Um, helped teach a a little short course for farmers in the winter months on agriculture, and they were handed out at those type of uh, events as well. So I I think they were well received. Yes, they were. And I thought it was interesting that there's a lot of meat like recipes in the book. There's a recipe for mock chicken and mock sausage and peanut patties because I guess he knew that meat was perhaps a luxury. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. Yes, and there was, and he could, and that that the individual could substitute meat by using, you know, making a mock product out of some of the recipes that he had that he came up with, and not only for the agriculture, I mean, for the peanut bulletin. Um, in most of his bulletins, there's there's recipes, and um, there's a lot of recipes, especially in the sweet potato one, um, the peanut one. Um, how to grow tomatoes. There's so many of them and so many wonderful practical things that, you know, we can even use, you know, use today. Yeah. I really liked looking at that book, the one on peanuts that is, and I saw some pretty yummy sounding recipes, including peanut almond fudge and peanut donuts. So my question to you, Curtis, have you ever tried to make any of those recipes in that book? Well, you know, I haven't, but we've had several of the rangers here try to make, um, reproduce some of the um, recipes and some of the bulls, especially the peanut ones. Now, some of the sweet ones sound pretty good, but the savory ones, eh, some of those don't sound too good to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a note in the book that I smiled at, um, he wrote, note, always remove the brown hull from the peanuts, even though the recipe doesn't say so. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. You know what, you know, with the peanut in particular, you know, most a lot of our visitors and, and people around the country, around the world, they, you know, they think of Carver just uh, as the peanut. And, you know, when Carver worked with the peanut, you know, it wasn't just the peanut itself that he worked with. He worked with every portion of the peanut, the skin, the shell, everything that he worked with. And you know, um, a lot of vi- a lot of people. I say I say visitors because you know that's what we deal with a lot of visitors. You know, a lot of people think of you know that um, when they think of the peanut, they think that they think of peanut butter. Well, a lot of our visitors think that George invented peanut butter, but George did not invent peanut butter. Um, by the time that George started working with the peanut in about 1903, peanut butter had already been. Um, invented by, we believe, a doctor in St. Louis that, you know, actually did made peanut butter. But I'm sure George made his own version of peanut butter. (laughs) Now, Booker T. Washington, who brought him to Tuskegee, um, like you were talking about, the two men didn't always see eye to eye. What do you know about that? No, you know, well, I'll, I'll say this. A lot of people often ask about that, about, about their relationship. And um, it, it seemed to be, you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat, somewhat rocky, somewhat. But you know, I think 
it was with Booker T. Washington, it was with all the faculty members. It wasn't just Carver, it was with all of his faculty members. Uh, I kind of, you know, joke somewhat or when I talk about it on tours, I, I often talk, mention that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, well, faculty members and, you know, college faculty members and presidents sometimes don't always get along. And that seemed to be the case at Tuskegee. And, you know, Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington was, um, was a very demanding, very, well, very demanding, I shouldn't say demanding, but he expected a lot out of his teachers, all of his teachers, including Carver. And he wanted Carver to teach, and he also wanted Carver to be an administrator. Well, Carver wasn't, didn't like the administrative part so much. And so the two kind of, the two butted hit several times. There's no doubt about that. Carver threatened to leave several times, um, Tuskegee. But I think they had a mutual respect for one another. You mentioned the education that he brought out to the farmers. Tell me more about how that worked. Okay, well, there was a, about 1903 or so, about 1903, Booker T. Washington encouraged the agriculture department because Carver, you know, Carver was in the agriculture department. He was head of the agricultural division. He encouraged them to go out further from the campus go out further and further and reach that rural farmer as, as much as you can. So George Washington Carver found that about, uh, there was a Tuskegee faculty member that had went to Europe or so. And he had noticed um, these movable schools on wheels. And so he brought the idea kind of back to Tuskegee. I think the Iowa man had one of them as well. And he kind of brought this idea back to Booker T. Washington worked with Carver and taught work with Carver on it. And so Carver became the head of this little, you know, this little project. And so um, Booker T, I mean, Booker T Washington secured money from a man by the name of Morris Jessup. And Morris Jessup was a wealthy New York banker. And George Washington Carver designed this wagon, a movable school on wheels. And it was called the Jessup wagon, Jessup agriculture wagon after Morris Jessup. And the wagon kind of started in about 19, about 1906 or so. So Carver outfitted the wagon, put all sorts of implements on the wagon, and they would take this wagon out. Carver never actually took the wagon out himself, but some of the other faculty did. And they would take this wagon out into the rural countryside. They would set it up at a church or on someone's farm where individuals would come around the wagon and gather around the wagon and learn the latest techniques and farming techniques and such. And so Carver was very proud of that and um, outfitted it for a few years. And then um, Booker T. Washington secured funds and where they were able to get a truck. And then they would take a you know truck where they could even go further out. But he was very, very proud of that Jessup wagon. And if visitors come to the park today, we have a little small replica in our museum of the Jessup wagon. So George Washington Carver was so much more than just peanuts. You know, like you said, he did research with sweet potatoes, uh, soybeans, then also cow peas and pecans and other crops. He was a dedicated artist, and there was so much more to him than just peanuts. And that's one thing that you try to convey to visitors, right? Yeah, so George was um, invited by a peanut association to go to Washington, D.C. for to speak on behalf of a peanut tariff on imported peanuts. So George agreed to that. And so he um, he appeared before the United States House Ways and Means Committee to speak uh, about peanuts and why they're so important and why there should be a tariff on, on imported peanuts. Well, when George first appeared before the committee, he appeared before the committee and he wasn't well received by the committee. At first, when he started to speak, they gave him his allotted 10 minutes, but they made some derogatory remarks about Carver, laughed at him several times, but George did not let any of that bother him. And he had a box and he had a box on the table and he started to pull things out of the box that he had, you know, made from peanuts. So the committee seemed to be in awe after the derogatory comments and such about the things that he was 
pulling out of this box that he made from peanuts or came up with peanuts. And at one point, the chairman said, you have unlimited amount of time. Go ahead and speak, brother. And so he spoke for about an hour or so. And after his hearing is when he was, it was written in newspapers, black and white newspapers about, you know, about George, about Carver appearing before Congress and kind of being known as the peanut man. So that's where that kind of came from. Now, you've been at the monument for some 15 years. What do you personally find most inspirational about Carver's story? Well, what I find most inspirational about the story is, is here that this kid, about 12 years old or so, had the courage and a determination to leave all on his own with nothing. He had nothing when he left here and went to Neil's show from the age of 12. He was on his own until he became an adult. And on that journey to Tuskegee, there was a lot of pitfalls. There were a lot of obstacles that stood in his way, but he never, never, never gave up. And he would encourage others. And, you know, it's such an, it's such an inspiring story. You know, this individual was born, you know, he was born enslaved, but, you know, he never experienced it. But he went through terrible times in American history towards African Americans. He went through Jim Crow, segregation, and never, never, never gave up. And today, in 2021, we have a national monument in this man's honor. And I think it's just an incredible story. It really is. Curtis, it's been a pleasure hearing about the life of George Washington Carver. I know it's hard to condense the life of a man in one short interview, but you did a great job with uh, all the information, all the details, and it was enjoyable to hear. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you very much. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. With mid-September here, fall colors are starting to transform many parks in the northern half of the country and wildlife are on the move. It's one of my favorite seasons in the parks, and I hope you get to enjoy it as well. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.